Welcome back from lunch, uh, and welcome to our, I don't know how many uh, annual debate program. Um, this is going to be a really good one, I can tell. Um, we, uh, so for those of you who, who might be new to, uh, new to the debate programs uh, at Researcher to Reader, this is how it's going to work. Uh, so you can see in your program the, uh, the debate proposition, which is academic libraries are no longer necessary. Um, we are going to start by polling the room to find out how many people here uh, agree with the proposition and how many disagree with it. And I think momentarily, uh, we're going to see a slide. Uh, so what, what you can do is you can either go to the community forum online and you'll see uh, debate first poll at the top of the uh, of the page of options there, or you can scan uh, the QR code that's on your table and that will take you directly to the polling, uh, to the polling site. Um, oh, we had the slide for a beautiful brief moment. There it is. So when you go to the poll, you should see uh, this in front of you. Uh, you need to first click on either for or against, depending on your position, and then, and this is very important, then you have to click on uh, cast vote, and then your vote will be cast. And momentarily, we should see uh, the results of the polling in real time. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I will very, very quickly uh, tell you about our debaters. So one of the really fun and interesting things about our debate program today is that the proposition is academic libraries are no longer necessary. We have a distinguished academic libra librarian arguing in favor of that proposition and a distinguished academic publishing professional arguing against it. So speaking in favor of the proposition will be Keith Webster, who is the Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, speaking against the proposition will be Mandy Hill, who is Managing Director of Academic Publishing at Cambridge University Press. The way this will work is Keith uh, will make his opening statement, and then Mandy will make her opening statement. Keith will then give a brief response to Mandy. Mandy will give a brief response to Keith. We will then have a discussion with the audience, and then as we come to the end of the hour, we'll take the poll again, and, and we'll see which side moved the most votes, and whichever side moved the most votes will be declared the winner. Do we have the poll results from the opening poll yet? Oh, there they are. I just don't see them on this screen. Oh, no. I, we may need to refresh the... Yeah, you, you may need to refresh your screen, but also you need to be logged in to vote. Oh, so yeah. make sure you've logged in um, before you try and vote. And then when you do, you should be able to vote and click the um, cast vote button. I have to say that so far, Mandy's doing really well. There we go. That's we should take a poll of how many people have been able to vote. <laughs> Or perhaps more importantly, how many people have not been able to vote? Raise your hand if you're having trouble voting. Oh boy. Um, so again, uh, make sure you've logged into the community forum. Uh, if you go to R2R, uh, is it R2R conference community forum or just R2R community forum, Mark? Yeah, but then we have to count them. Uh, is anybody still struggling to get their vote cast? A few people still? Could we refresh the screen and see how many more votes have come in? Could we refresh the screen? So we still only have 23 votes? There we go. Oh, uh, no. It's not me. Okay, I think... It's not a lot of votes. I, uh, that may be as... A... 
Okay, we, we, seem to be, we seem to be having trouble with the online poll, so we're gonna do this the old school way. Everybody who is in favor of the proposition that academic library, no, sorry, everybody who is against the proposition, academic libraries are no longer necessary. If you're against the proposition, raise your hand. Crap. <laughs> yeah, that's the old school way is not gonna work. Yeah, if you're in favor of the proposition that academic libraries are no longer necessary, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. Okay, that's going to be the number that we watch to change. All right. Uh, eight, we're in favor. I'm going to forget if I don't write that down. All right, Keith. All right. The only thing that you absolutely have to know is the location of the library, said Albert Einstein. For many years, I've quoted Charles W. Eliot, president of Harvard, who in 1873 stated, the library is the heart of the university. But today I'm perhaps more indebted to my friend David Lenx for extending Eliot's anatomical metaphor to that of the spleen. In many universities today, the library has become something people aren't sure that they have, they're not sure where to find it, and if they did, they wouldn't know what to do with it. It would be reckless to argue for the closure or elimination of all or indeed any libraries. A world without the Bodleian or the Widener would be a desolate place. But if Lanx is right, and there are many indicators that he is, we need to be concerned. It is wholly possible to argue that the library, as we knew it, has had its day. I'll present a case that the conditions for obsolescence are in place. Those who wish to save the library, in whatever form they think it should take, may hear a cautionary tale. Those who came today to bid the library farewell may gain a sense of momentum. At a time of financial pressure, rising costs of a university education and demand for space on university campuses, the library cannot be immune from review. Thirty years ago, the Follett Report on the Future of British University Libraries was released. Within the report was a scenario set in the year 2001, describing the lives of a number of personas on a university campus. Many of the technological projections in the scenarios are commonplace today, including digital delivery of texts and streaming of multimedia resources. The report's predictions of the demise of the library building. Some of the old university library had been given over for parking. Since the building was extraordinarily strong, and had successfully resisted the installation of so much cable, have not stood the test of time. It is tough to argue libraries are not popular at a time when those buildings that bear the word library are busier than ever. Our ideate programme, home to a series of hugely popular minors, delivers around 100 full courses of study each year, bringing thousands of faculty and students through our doors each week. Our coffee shop is not only the finest on campus, but one of the best in the whole of the city, where long lines form every day. Our study areas are always full. The count of visitors in the past decade has more than doubled. But in many ways, whilst these people are choosing to be in our space, and we're delighted to welcome them, they are not using our library as a library. We've lost the inner essence of libraryness. And it is that loss, which may be irreversible, that jeopardizes the standing of the institution. To understand this, we need to consider why universities established libraries. I speak here of the libraries of the university system of the late 19th and 20th century through to the present day. The growth of the scientific world, and I use science in the broadest sense, was accompanied by the industrialization of printing and publishing, and an explosion in the volume of research content. No individual scholar could afford to acquire everything that might be relevant to their needs, nor did they have the space in which to house such a collection. The library was established as a community resource, a facility in which a shared collection of materials might be housed. This is the model which gave rise to the essence of libraryness to which I refer. The investment in science after the Second World War led to a further period of great expansion in universities and their libraries continue to acquire greater numbers of books. 
Let me illustrate this by referring to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, since Lisa is here, one of the great public universities in the United States. It was founded in 1867, and its library opened the following year with a collection of just over 1,000 volumes. In 1935, the millionth book was added, and today the collection contains more than 14 million items. There were two drivers behind this expansion, which can be charted in most research universities. Firstly, books were frequently in print only for a short period of time, and copies were acquired quickly in case they might ever be needed in the future. But there was also a prestige factor. Great libraries, often measured by volume count, attracted great scholars, and in turn those scholars brought funding to support a continued expansion of library collections, which in turn attracted even more great scholars and so on. It was a virtuous cycle. Fast forward to the present day. The use of printed library collections in general academic libraries has been in free fall for many years, largely driven by shifts to digital forms of books and journals. The pandemic served as an accelerant. Today, most prefer the affordances of digital, access anywhere, anytime, with powerful annotation and note-taking capabilities. We're also seeing AI support discovery, providing alternatives to the serendipitous browsing that was so long seen as the domain of the printed collection. This digital shift is reflected also in expenditure on information, with research libraries today often spending 80 to 90 per cent of their collection budgets on electronic collections, frequently on large packages of content renewed on a periodic basis. It is evident that on many campuses the library today is the custod custodian of rarely used print materials and hugely popular digital collections. Viewed through the lens of the library user, this is a great situation. Most are able to find almost everything they need, wherever they are and whenever they wish to work. No longer do they have to encounter missing or checked out items or torn out pages and illustrations. And the expansion of open access serves to grow the array of available content. We should take note also of relevant scholarly output that exists on the open web and in institutional and disciplinary repositories. I've heard arguments advanced that the purchase of most scholarly content should be transferred to the research administration of a university, where so many other similar commitments are managed. The argument is that millions of dollars or pounds are spent each year with little of the traditional library collection building process. These are serious proposals, ones that are likely to gain traction, and we shouldn't ignore the collective groups of university leaders who discuss such ideas. Publishers have observed that librarians are weak negotiators, and universities will wish to introduce skilled procurement experts into the licensing process. If the marketplace for information now exists online and provides the most important function that the library did in the past, then from a rational economic perspective, the university should shift to that market. The library is no longer the primary information provider on campus. Academic librarians should be planning on the basis that sooner or later, their university will indeed change its approach. What we see today is that the library, that is the building that was created to house the, library, the university's collections, has become a very different space. Little used collections have been moved to off-site stores or discarded to free up study space for the growing numbers of students pursuing higher education. We can form arguments in support of these facilities being in libraries, but there are no strong reasons why they couldn't be part of a student services group. Warm and comfortable space, power, fast Wi-Fi and decent coffee are not the exclusive characteristics of a library. There have been many welcome transformations to the library building over the past 20 years beyond study space and coffee shops. Digital data visualization studios, maker spaces and the like provide highly valued facilities. But again, I question whether these need to be housed in libraries. Might they more usefully be co-located with disciplinary experts elsewhere on campus? The need for librarians, by which I mean experts in the information aspects of academic disciplines, does continue to grow. They provide critical skills in data management, the navigation of the digital information landscape, and training in data and information literacy. 
But increasingly, their ex expertise is required outside the library. In most fields today, they do not need to be co-located with print collections for reasons that I've outlined. Instead, their role is one of collaboration and partnership with researchers and students, and they need to be present in the labs, studios, and academic offices where they conduct their business. Many researchers stopped coming to the library in the early 2000s, and we need to meet them where they are. They no longer build their information activities around the library's workflow, but rather we need to insert our expertise into their workflows, ensuring that our skills and services and information content are accessible where and when needed. Let me return where I started with Albert Einstein. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Thank you. The Academic Library is the home of the Academic Librarian, and one without the other is inconceivable. So in many ways, I don't really need my 10 minutes. I could just stand here and say, where else within the university is there the expertise to support the early career researcher as they start to delve into new topics and ensure that they don't think that Sci-Hub is where they need to go for all of their information needs? But I suppose I should say a bit more than that. But if I was trying to to try and convince you that the library that many of us knew when we were at university is still important, I'm sure I would fail. It would be like saying that the value of academic publishers is just to make pretty books. But just like publishers, researchers, and practically everything else I can think of, the role of the librarian and the library has and will continue to evolve. What we've got to think about is what's that underlying role that the library and the librarian play within a university. For me, it's about supporting ac academics in their research and students in their learning, supporting the content that's created and looking after the content that's held and used across the university. It's not about a building. Universities want their academics to compete by being up to date in their research. And they want to ensure that the results of that work has the most impact possible. Universities want to achieve this as efficiently as possible so they don't want to reinvent the wheel all over the place or have money burned in poor purchasing decisions. So let me just try and talk you through what a, a, the academic world would look like without the libra library or the librarian. So instead of big deals, consortia and transformative agreements, there would still be 1,001 individual and duplicate subscriptions across every university and open access would still be largely funded by APCs. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that consortia agreements or transformative agreements are the only or even the best approach for everybody, but they have been efficient and many universities have saved significant money through that approach. We could have a whole separate debate about what should come next to fix the underlying economic issues with various publishing models. And I do personally worry that we are currently running the risk of replacing one fundamentally unaffordable model with another. But wherever we go, we're going, I think the librarian community is going to be vital in us moving into a new era with real solutions. We see time and again that we come up with better models for the market through discussions with empowered and experienced librarians. Where would that institutional voice come from in the shift to open access, if not from the librarian community? Sticking with the open access theme, it's no coincidence that most universities have created, that have created scholarly communications units have placed them within the library. Librarians that already understood journal, the journal's world were well placed to transition to support authors, um, either as they needed to or chose to move to open access publishing. Think of that brand new author wondering where to publish. In many cases, they're going to be guided by their senior researchers in their departments. But what happens if that senior researcher is anti-open access and the university is in favour? or that senior researcher still thinks that good publishing means publishing in high impact factor journals, but the university is a committed member of DORA. Who's gonna provide that guidance other than the central librarian team? I don't think there's gonna be major change in author behavior without that central team. They, 
Of course, librarians can't do it alone, but they are vital if we are to achieve a full and sustainable open access transition. And so what about that uh, traditional role of, of a librarian as a curator of content, purchasing collections and providing discovery tools to help researchers find material relevant to their needs? I'm sure we all recognise that researchers can find and access a lot of information now without the help of a librarian or visiting the library. And as open access continues to grow, barriers to access will continue to, to decline. But I think we all also know that just putting your um, search terms into Google and looking at the top 10 results isn't necessarily going to give you the best results. I would argue, actually, that the role of the librarian to help academics navigate the mountain of information available to them is actually even more important now. Helping academics, students, uh, academics and students understand how to spot the difference between resources, those that they should trust and those to avoid, is a service that everyone benefits from. So don't for a moment think that just because we've got open access, that negates the need for the librarian. Again, it just changes the role. It's like saying just because an author can post their content directly onto the internet without support from publishers, they should. And clearly that's bonkers. This, this role of curator has expanded to include institutional repositories and data management. All universities want to ensure they maintain archives of everything their researchers produce. And they also have an obligation to ensure data is well managed and preserved. Who else has the skills to do it other than librarian? And do you really want that happening across multiple places? And of course, we are a long way from all content being open access anyway. Even in the not too distant future, I hope, all research articles are published open access. There is so, such a wide variety of material that the librarian acquires and curates. Think monographs, reference works, um, data sets, for example. I guess you could move um, the purchasing of all of this into a procurement team. You run the risk that they may well purchase based on price rather than academic value. And they could then, once having bought all of that content, put it into a repository and let AI work its magic instead of having a trained librarian curate it. But as with everything AI, you get the best out of it when it's the power of AI paired with the wisdom of a human expert. And without librarians, what would happen with archives and special collections? These are invaluable resources that need to be maintained. And then let's think about students. In the old world, libraries didn't have that much to do with providing students with access to textbooks. Um, it might have been where you, a student went to sit, but probably not much more. But as we move into digital products, where in the university are there better skills to assess and curate the available products and ensure that students and lecturers are getting the best out of them? Really helping to ensure that lecturers improve learning uh, outcomes through the products that they're using. In fact, a recent outsell report identified the library as the place where students like to try out new tools and has been perfectly positioned to help reduce dropout rates by ensuring students have the resources they need so they don't fall behind or feel out of their depth. And finally, without librarians, would the space of the library itself be maintained? I've left this to last, but we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that physical space to campus life and to students in particular. It's essential. Hundreds of renovations have shown how much libraries have understood and embraced their role as a provider of individual and group working space. So in short, a world without, library, li without libraries and librarians will be one where the readers use Sci-Hub for all of their content needs, authors publish where they've always published and struggle to move to open access, treasured collections fall into disrepair and student dropout rates and engagement levels continue to be a headache for all universities. And I hope that's not going to be a world that you vote for. Thank you. Before I come to my own points, let us first have a look at what my opponent has said. She has drawn her arguments largely in favour of librarians rather than of libraries. And I'm truly grateful for her endorsement of my profession. But I must take issue with her remarks in a few ways. Firstly, in respect of the motion as stated, she offers a very narrow role for the library as a provider of facilities for individual and group study. There are many on campus who could and do provide space, 
and we have no right to exist unless we can do so better than anyone else. At best, we have a legacy of a decent amount of real estate in the heart of campus, and that can be repurposed for study needs, but is that a valid raison d'etre? Should we defend the expense on library services, some 2 to 3 per cent of a typical university budget, on the grounds that we have comfortable chairs? Secondly, she points to the impact librarians have on open access, but I'm not persuaded that we have any right to an exclusive role in these matters. Indeed, perhaps only publishers would wish us to. Jan Velterop, who will be known to many of you, once said, librarians have limited power. They also have no strong track record when it comes to negotiating. That is their weakness and the publisher's strength. In my university, and we're not unique, the expectation is that we have agreements in place, just as we did with the big deal, that provide for universal open access on multiple year contracts. Putting these agreements in place has been shaped deeply by disciplinary faculty. As we shift from a business model focused on reading, where indeed librarians had decent insights into trends, data and behaviours, to one that is focused on publishing, it is right that authors gain prominence in the process. It is they who can tell us about projected publication volumes, a key metric in transformative agreements. And it is they who understand the nuances of long-run impacts on societies. I sit in my university's promotion and tenure committee and I've been deeply impressed by the understanding of both open access and of the merits and demerits of different journals in the discipline. I honestly can find little to add to my colleagues' disciplinary expertise. And that's why I increasingly hire people with that expertise, as they can understand the current trends and debates, appreciate the norms of communication, and navigate the increasing array of relevant scholarly content that sits outside the formal version of record. But they are recruited for their disciplinary know-how and not for any sense of librarianness. But let me return to the substance of the debate, that libraries are no longer necessary. I offer you two points that my opponent has failed to address. Firstly, the library is no longer the primary provider of scholarly content on campus. And secondly, the use of library space has shifted and today is primarily devoted to activities that could and often are managed by others in a university setting. I'm afraid your time's up. Perfect time. Thank you, Rick. So it's very interesting that Keith has picked out that I was talking about the library as a physical space because I felt that that's actually the point that he was making. For me, what I was trying to say is the library is so much more than this. That is one part of it. The, the library is, the, is a hub, it's the home of the librarian, it's a service in so many ways to so much of the university. Don't think of it as a bricks and mortar edifice, it's a hub of expertise, a centralised set of services to inform and enhance knowledge, teaching and research, and that has been in, enabled by the evolving skills of the librarians. I'm sure we all agree that some of the physical archives um, are still essential to have in place and they can you know, bring so much benefit, but much of it can be um, now shipped off, off site um, because the content can be accessed online and that space can be, be used for much better reasons. But I do agree with Keith that the, the space of the library is now used for, in so many different ways and, and has been designed to really spur on students' understanding and support researchers in their quest for knowledge. Where I don't agree with Keith is the idea that all of this should be disaggregated across the university. One simple reason for this is it doesn't make sense from an efficiency point of view. The university is going to end up duplicating costs and having much more space in total dedicated to these functions. In an age of limited resources, this just would not be feasible. And those librarian skills that I've highlighted would also end up being disaggregated and that would mean a loss of total expertise. No central team in supporting authors transitioning to open access. And you're right, it's not just something that librarians can do, but it needs to be brought together for real impact. Multiple teams working on institutional archives and probably developing slightly different approaches and, poli approaches and policies across the university. Um, and that would be, again, a headache for the university at large. But I also shudder with this idea of co-locating the various newer functions a library is performing um, with the disciplinary experts across campus. 
For example, most universities are going to want to support the wider use and understanding of data management and visualisation. They're going to want students to really engage with this. And students from lots of different disciplines. So where would that go? Into the computer science department? Can you imagine that nervous history student? They know that they really need to engage with data. They, they want to get into digital, digital humanities, for example, but they're going to be terrified of walking into the computer science department to see if they can learn about data visualisation. They would be so nervous about asking the daft question. They want to walk into a, that safe space of the library and know that they're going to be aided by that, that librarian who understands their needs. So don't knock down the library. Let it continue to evolve. Universities, their students and their researchers need both the physical and virtual space and the expert librarians within them. Thank you. I have to say those were the, in, I've been doing this for many years, those were the two most perfectly timed responses I've uh, encountered so far. Both of them, their last word literally landed at three minutes. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to take a few minutes uh, for audience discussion. Mark, could we get a handheld mic for the debaters? Ruby's gonna bring it. Uh, and we also have roving mics for those who are going to uh, pose questions. So, uh, and, and I'll, I'll say too, often at conferences when, uh, when we open it up to discussion, the moderator will be very strict about saying that's not a question, that's a statement. In the context of a debate, you're more than welcome to make a statement. You can ask a question of the debaters or you can contribute to the uh, conversation yourself in the hope of shifting the final vote more towards whatever your position is. So. Feel free, the floor is open. Yes, at the back. Hello, Jennifer Smith from St. George's University of London, proud librarian. Um, yes, I would just like to address a question. Um, if if libraries are seen as weak negotiators, how best can we be hard negotiators? Thank you. Sounds like a Keith question. Um, it's a great question. From my own experience, what I do is for complex matters. I do involve colleagues from our contracts office. Um, and on occasion I have my provost join me when we negotiated our big transformative agreement with Elsevier. He was part of the conversation, not because I don't feel up to negotiating, but his presence added an, an element of university support for what we were trying to achieve. The one thing that I'm conscious of is that we have few levers to pull when we are negotiating with a publisher. If the publisher says, no, you can't have a price cut or a capped price increase or whatever it might be. We only have the ability to walk away and do without a license. And that puts us in a fairly weak position at a time when our scholarly community requires access to the content. So in many ways, I'm going to pass this to a publisher and tell us how we could be better negotiators. <laughs> I'm not, certainly not going to answer that question, um, but, I, but I would say that it will, you would be in a much weaker position if that negotiating was disaggregated across the university. Having that central team who are experts, who are able to draw on the, the knowledge, really having some weight is going to make it a stronger negotiation. Karen, I think, and then uh, Robert behind her. Thank you. What a super interesting debate. I wanted to ask you about a premise that I think sits behind both of your comments, which is that what libraries provide now is primarily digital. And I don't just ask this as a person who runs a rare book library where we do provide digital copies, but where the physical copy is equally, if not more important, but rather with the increasing amount of research that suggests that reading in print has deep value for researchers and for learners at all stages. What do we do with that research now that suggests that maybe the print object 
which libraries are pretty uniquely designed to hold, may in fact be invaluable. I've got two contradictory thoughts that are going around in my head. On the one hand, I agree with you, um, but the content being there doesn't mean that people are going to come and use it, unfortunately. So um, I don't think we're going to be able to turn back the tide of people uh, accessing content online for that day-to-day -day need. You know, people accessing journal content, they're not going to suddenly turn up at the library door and, and be reading that. Where I think the print archive is so invaluable is, is those uh, rare works that you're talking about where so much is lost if you're just looking at it on screen you're not going to you're not really going to be able to get the full benefit of the work so i think there's the, i think we're going to be in a position where an awful lot of reading still happens online and that and that's a good thing because of the accessibility um, but there will be a balance point where people still really do need and value the, the print and having that available to people on on the university campus i think is is absolutely essential as I think I said in my opening statement, the, the ship has sailed. The reduction in the use of print materials has been you know, faster than any of us anticipated a decade ago. And I can recall just before the pandemic, our humanities faculty saying how they still needed book collections because of the, the importance of print. Post-pandemic, when they had had to make do with digital content for the six, seven months that our libraries were closed, they have appreciated the affordances of having ready access to a vaster collection of content than ever would have been possible had we tried to build that in print. I've read the research about the, um, that, that print is easier to, to work with. It promotes deeper long-term understanding. And I'm not going to predict the future of the long-form printed scholarly monograph, but perhaps easier licensing terms from publishers to allow us to print hard copies on demand from digital versions would allow those who prefer to work with print to do so easily and affordably. Although terrible from a sustainability point of view. I'm just going to put that in there. Okay. <laughs> Though, though digitization, it, it poses its own sustainability issues when you think about the water and the energy required to uh, sustain uh, digital servers. Uh, Robert. I'm Robert Harrington from the American Mathematical Society. And, you know, we bemoan some of the loss of mathematics expertise in libraries. Um, and we also bemoan, to some extent, the, the less communication between faculty and the library. Um, there, are, there is some, but it's sometimes there's a disconnect. Should academic libraries be moved back into the department? Not as a centralized academic library, but housed within the department. In many ways, I wouldn't wish upon my successors the trauma of 30 years from now trying yet again to undo disciplinary libraries. But there, there is absolutely an argument in favour of disciplinary experts representing the libraries to be located in and amongst the disciplines with which they interact. And mathematicians are forever telling me that they are special and different, so I absolutely <laughs> accept that. Uh, mathematicians will also tell you that they read the print journals and then they, and then they won't, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I know. Uh, <laughs> At the beginning of my career in, in this country, I remember sitting at the reference desk in my university library and I would build up a regular relationship with academic staff who would come in by habit, maybe once a week, some every day, to browse the latest journals. And that passing interaction allowed me to gain an understanding of what they were working on, their research, their courses, and in turn, we could proactively reach out and provide support. Those days have gone, and I've, I've even stopped now the game that I used to play of going into an academic department and asking the assembled faculty when they last visited the library, because truly many of them don't even realize we have a library, and I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. And that comes to the, the point I made in my remarks, that we need to be present where they are, and that location of expertise close to academic departments absolutely makes sense if we are to 
deliver value to them. Sermon over. <laughs> Good. What else? Sorry, I can't see who that is. Yeah. It, it's Tony Ellis from High Wire Press. Uh, so I was at NISO Plus last week, and I was really impressed with a bunch of the um, presentations, primarily from librarians, about artificial intelligence and uh, the amount that they understand and know about what resources are available for their researchers. And I was thinking, well, this is something I hadn't realized before, but I was, I, I just found, well, if, I thought, well, of course. This is a great place for all of this, all of this knowledge to congregate and, and to come together. So I'm taking advantage of not having a question and trying to persuade people to uh, keep our libraries uh, open. As someone who can't retire for another few years, I appreciate that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> wow. Are we really done with comments and questions? I'm, I'm kind of shocked. There's, uh, Mark's got one, or maybe there's one online. Um, we were here. So, uh, so no, not, nothing online. There's nothing on our, our forum chat except for me apologizing for the vote fiasco, which I have to say is entirely my fault and not Rick's. Uh, we did manage to get about 50 people vote, logged in and, and, and voting, so, you know, there was progress. Anyway, um, uh, I, and in consequence of some of that, I'm, I have to admit, I didn't listen to every word of the debate. I'm looking forward to watching the video uh, later. But I, a point I often talk to people about is, is the library dead, but the librarian not dead? And so you did in your talks, I think, distinguish a bit between the building and the process. But can you envisage a, a, a future where there's no building but lots of librarians, or indeed conversely, where there is a building but there aren't any librarians? Sounds like a Keith question too. Oh, no, Mandy? I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, very much a world where librarians are ever more present. And in my university, we have hired more librarians over the past decade than at any time in my university's 125 years of history. So the demand for the services and expertise of those employed by the libraries continues to grow. The library as an institution, at least in a technological university, is not as vibrant as it was. And it is by repurposing the library building that we continue to draw an audience. But I suspect that that audience would find place in which to do their academic business elsewhere quite easily. Keith, in that scenario, would you anticipate that the people that we now call librarians would still be called librarians and would they still have library degrees? Um, I would say about half of ours don't have library degrees at the moment, uh, but typically have PhDs and postdoc or early academic career experience in their disciplines. We wrestle with the word librarian, um, at least in a university like ours, when we connect with computer science faculty, for example, that if you say something like, I'm here from the library, the door closes or the email is deleted fairly quickly. But we, I absolutely appreciate that we don't have a better term. In my last university in Australia, we tried my predecessor tried the word cyprarian, and that was just dreadful. <laughs> so um, it, it is a visible and trusted brand, that of I'm a librarian, even if I haven't been to library school. Good, Andy. I'm struggling slightly with the distinction between uh, a, a hub where librarians work together, share expertise, uh, talk to each other, and people know that they can find them, distinguishing that from a library. If, if what we're talking about is, is a library that houses every single journal that's ever been printed and um, a group of books that nobody has uh, read in print for 50 years, I think that probably is a, would have been a much shorter conversation. Um, if we're talking about a place, a, 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 both a physical space and a virtual space where people can go 
for help with their information needs, to understand content, to, to trust content, um, to get guidance in, their, in finding the, the, the information they need. That's the space that I think we're really talking about. And, and so then I don't see that separation between librarian and library in the same way. I'll try that one. I suspect that Rick and I started our careers at a time when the role of the librarian was intimately connected with the physical collections in our libraries because that's what the collections were. In the late 80s, early 90s, there were no online materials. And the service model at that time was the librarian assisting students, researchers, in the use of print collections. We helped build collections appropriate to our institutions academic mission and we supported people in discovering what they required to support their studies or their research. Fast forward to the present day, most of that content is online and I honestly don't know when somebody last came, certainly well, they wouldn't come to me, but come into the library to ask for help in finding information in an online resource. Most people go to Google or the more sophisticated of our clients use the, the platforms that many of you publish and sell. And we do not need to be in a library to provide that service. Sure, co-location is great in the sense that librarians can share expertise and build upon each other's activities. But equally, if we take that distributed model of the librarian more closely connected to the academic community they are serving, then they do not need to be located in a physical library building. I'm just going to compare and contrast. You're, you're saying that when you were started as a librarian, it was in a particular way. When I started as a publisher, I had a green pen, a red pen, and I would hard copy, mark up the manuscripts. And if we did get this little square thing that apparently you could put into a computer, um, <laughs> we threw it in the bin. Um, <laughs> So both of our professions have come a long way. I still consider myself to be a publisher. Um, I still work for a publisher. So I, I think that the evolution of what we do is real, um, but I think the, the, the essence of it is still, is still material. There's a question right down front, Ruby, right there. Yeah, um, imagine, I imagine I could be a researcher, would be a researcher, and uh, I have a digital research assistant working on my behalf. I bring my digital research assistant to my meetings, to my, to my Zoom and my Teams, and my digital research assistant goes off and finds things for me and summarizes things for me, and my digital research assistant gets to know me really well and what I need to, to, to look at. I don't need anybody or anybody to do that. I just point my assistant and off they go. I wonder what the um, debaters think about that. How do you know to trust what that digital research assistant delivers to you? I'm sure that's a very good point, but I could build into my algorithm and build into my profile the kinds of things I like to look at and it would perhaps get to uh, uh, understand from the feedback that I, what I'm looking at and not looking at that it puts in front of me as to the kinds of uh, uh, content or data sets, whatever it happens to be, because it doesn't need to be the manuscript anymore, it can be data sets, it can be all kinds of uh, different content types from, from all over. Um, and perhaps that's one of the filters that the research, the human, can place on top of that, but maybe my algorithms can be good enough to do that. And that's great for you if you're in a position to have access to those tools and you're able to understand them in that way. What about that 23-year-old who's just starting out and maybe doesn't have that? Oh, we're going to have a back and forth. Yeah, we will. I think you touched on a really important point, which is that the body of academic information, however you, you wish to define that, goes way beyond what we license from publishers or, or purchase in print. There are petabytes, exabytes of research data that are relevant to researchers. Otherwise, why do funding agencies around the world mandate that researchers share their data? 
software and code is an important part of the scholarly record. The community conversations that, exists in, that exist in blogs, on social media, are an important part of the scholarly record. And your digital assistant will be able to navigate that vast landscape much more effectively even than an expert librarian. But I absolutely agree that there are concerns about the integrity of the scholarly record. And even inside an academic field, you will have experts who are at odds with each other and where there is no clear sense of what is right and what is wrong. And that is where my support of the librarian is critical. But you don't need a library for that librarian to be critical either to help you understand the integrity of what your digital assistant provides or perhaps to provide something that is a value add on top of the digital assistant. We're agreeing with each other. Nearly. <laughs> um, I think the, the, this idea of all of these different librarians across the university, the, the loss of expertise, of you know, you're going to reinvent the wheel. So you might be working with your librarian to, to um, check that you trust your uh, digital research assistant. Somebody in the maths department could work with their librarian to do exactly the same, in the English department to do exactly the same, come up with versions on a theme. That's inefficient, it's a waste of effort and it's not going to lead to the best results. If those people were working together, you're going to have experts who can really hone those skills and make sure that everybody has access to the best digital research assistant rather than some people who happen to have the librarian who really understands it. But then you could have all of those librarians sharing an office complex. It's called a library. And yeah, what would you call that? <laughs> Too <shit. laughs> Uh There's another question or comment at the back. R raise your hand up again real high. There we go. Hi, thank you for this. Um, so my question is for both of you. How or does setting, like type of academic library, play into this? So I'm thinking we could pull on, you know, a very small undergraduate focused university, 4,000 students, five librarians, compared to a giant graduate focused, 100 plus librarians. Does that influence things? How? Yes. <laughs> uh, but then you asked how. Um, I think in many ways, you know, I, I've been a dean of libraries in four different universities, each with very different disciplinary strengths. Uh, my first one was at SOAS, about 250 metres from here. And I do think that in institutions with a weight behind humanities and social sciences, it will have a very different response to my current university, which is renowned for computer science and engineering. You know, th these have never been collections heavy types of institutions and certainly the institutional audience will drive a difference something that is you know a liberal arts undergraduate college will have a very different expectation and need of librarians than something like Carnegie Mellon I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to agree with you sorry Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think we, we've got one more comment here, and I think that then we're going to have to go ahead and retake the poll. Services. There we go. Thank you. So, um, I, I've been working with uh, research librarians for more than 25 years, and I saw them shifting close, for example, to research management offices, with ser services closed to that area in research, uh, in universities or close to academic presses through um, library hosted uh, university presses. So the question, my question to debaters is how much the libraries and librarians wants to be, want to be distinctive or similar to these services? And what would any of these choices bring them? In many ways, your question speaks to a fundamental shift from outside in to inside out. In the outside-in model of the library, our role was of acquiring collections from outside, typically by giving money to publishers, so that individuals on our campuses could build upon research done elsewhere. And for a variety of reasons, we have seen that model 
somewhat shift and, and I think a logical extension of the move towards open access will be a rapid um, diminution in the need for us to spend money buying stuff from the outside. But the inside out model is one where we think about the scholarship that is conducted on our campus and how we help our research community share their ideas, their findings with the world. Now, some of that will still be through submitting articles and monograph manuscripts to publishers. But increasingly, the artifacts of the research process, and you mentioned data as a prominent one, are susceptible simply to capture, curation, and sharing on a campus through a, an institutional or a disciplinary data repository. And I think that that fundamental shift is at the heart of your question. And I can see Mandy agree with me, so maybe I should just switch off the microphone and go to the vote. But I will let her respond as well. I largely do agree with you, and I, and I think that sense of the librarians being close to their, their communities and understanding what they need and, and that evolution of need is, is significant. And, you know, as you say, they used, they, the role used to be understanding the information that researchers needed to have access to, and now it's about how to support that um, maximising of the impact of the research that's done within the university. But again, it comes back to being close and close enough to your uh, academics, but having that expertise. And and so, yeah, I think we are. Well, it's a terrible place to end a debate, isn't it? Actually, agreeing. <laughs> That's awful. But well, nevertheless, we are. But, going but to we are talking about librarians and not libraries, but, as we agree. But you have already admitted that you should then co-locate the librarians and in a building that perhaps <laughs> we could call a library. <laughs> All right, so I think, uh, first of all, please join me in thanking our debaters. <laughs> Excellent job, both. Okay, uh, I think since we, since we took the original, ended up taking the original poll within the room, I think we're gonna have to limit the second poll to inside the room as well, but I think it's gonna be relatively easy. Please raise your hand if you now agree with the proposition that academic libraries are no longer necessary. One, one, two, three, four. Is, that, is your hand up, sir, with a beard? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Holy cow, it's a draw. <laughs> All right, congratulations, well done. And I think I get to, I, I now have the, uh, the enviable uh, role of, of being able to dismiss you to a break. <laughs>